Oh yes, we want to read from James this morning to get our thoughts started. James chapter 1. We've enjoyed James. He goes verse by verse and almost changes the subject every other verse. Uh, James 1. I'm going to start with verse 21. Now we just thought on the verses ahead of that where we're told to be swift to hear. How are you doing? Slow to speak. How are you doing? Slow to wrath. Let me out of here. <laughs> Oh, yes. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. So he's talking about what we just mentioned there. Then he slips into verse 21, King James Version. Wherefore, lay aside all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. Now that's that's quite an expression, isn't it? I haven't heard that word naughty used for a long time. But anyway. And receive with meekness the engrafted word of God which is able to save your soul. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a mirror, and he sees what he sees, and he doesn't do anything about it. That's as far as we'll read. Now it starts out by telling us to lay aside all filthiness. Doesn't tell what it, what it means, does it? Just get rid of filthiness. But I think we can pretty well analyze this. It's talking about our moral impurities. Boy, wouldn't this verse ricochet around Washington. All moral impurities. And then he says superfluity of naughtiness, which is a term that covers all wicked ways. Now the scriptures do not always make a list of, of sins. So you don't have that here. We do have it at different sections of the Bible. Like Galatians 5. Or even the Ten Commandments. A special list, but here he just says lay aside filthiness and naughtiness. I think that's kind of a mild term for what he's trying to get at. But anyway, since he doesn't make a list, then our conscience is expected to know enough and to warn us enough without a checklist. Have you thought about that? You know, throughout our Christian life, we go to church, we learn this, we learn that, we learn more, and we keep adding to that constantly. And we add that to the experiences that we uh, experience. And all of this is growing in our minds and filling us full and educating our conscience. And this becomes our moral compass. So we don't, we don't have to have a list that every time we face up to, with something that, uh, uh, let's see if that's on the list. Our conscience becomes that part of us that says, uh-oh, no, no, or, Yes. 
So our conscience is expected to take over without a, a list. So now what? We're back to a couple of thoughts that we want to talk about here. Mainly one. And the first thought is this. Receive with meekness the engrafted Word of God. Now that's quite a thought. May not seem like it right off. There is a right kind of spirit that we need to have. And uh, you know it isn't always easy to have a good, good spirit. We have to work on our spirit. So this is encouraging us to have a, a meek, humble, teachable spirit. And that's hard to get in the religious thinking of our time when people's minds are so filled with all kinds of everything else. And you know what that is as well as I do, maybe a little better. So we're to receive the Word of God with the right kind of disposition. So I guess one of the best things that we can do for ourselves is that when we go to church, we're around people, in church, out of church, every day of our life, is to constantly make sure that I have a very teachable good spirit about the right things of the Bible and life itself. You know, that's kind of hard to do. It's kind of like being sensible when you just hit your thumb with a, a heavy maul. What do you think about then? <laughs> Who wants to talk about ice cream at that point? So a right kind of disposition is reasonable, it's logical, and very right. But you notice it says, receive with meekness the engrafted word of God. This means that the, the, the word of God, the engrafted word of God, comes from another outside source. You know how they, they graft trees. I haven't really read up on it, I've read some. Where they cut a slit in the tree and, and they slip something else in and, and they tape it all up and that's supposed to be it. Yeah, we got a couple of nice trees years ago and it was supposed to bear six different kinds of fruit. I think we were fortunate to get one. <laughs> of course I didn't take the best care of things when they get out of hand, especially if somebody wants to pull a calf or mow hay or something else to do. So that didn't plan out too good, but they do all of that through grafting. And that's exactly the same thing that the Bible is trying to get across with us here. The engrafted Word of God. The Scriptures are from God. And it takes it takes an extra person to have the kind of disposition that says, I love truth. In Thessalonians, we're taught that if people love not the truth, God will eventually send them a delusion. And so they can't comprehend it. And that's what's going on in our country today. God in His movement, moving, and people being deluded because they'll not receive the truth. But the Scriptures are from God and they are 
uh, a dynamic source outside of us. It's not another book. It's not another pamphlet. It's a special something that comes to us from God. Now, I know that a lot of people treat the Bible very sacred and they won't write in it and all that. And I can appreciate that. But still beyond that, there's something special about the Word of God because of what happens when it's engrafted into you from an outside source into you. The results are huge. Now some graphs don't take, obviously. Sure didn't work with us. <laughs> it's probably me more than th that. But at the same time, there's a lot of engrafting that does not take place. But it is your good, good way and disposition to love and be teachable so that when this outside source comes your way, that we eat it up. Hunger and thirst after righteousness. Eat it up. Love it. There's just something that moves inside of you. And you say it's so right and so good. And so what it ought to be. So it's telling us to receive with the right kind of disposition this outside source into us like it's been engrafted into us. Taped up and wrapped up in good shape. And then this second thought able to save your soul. This engrafted word with the right reception is able to save your soul. Well, what's that? I say it couldn't be any higher stakes than that because I know what I know. And I'm sorry that there's so many that don't know that much about their soul and how important for that soul to go back to heaven when your body goes in the other direction to the cemetery. We couldn't want for anything more for us in our lifetime to ready our soul so that it lifts off at the right time back to God who gave it in the first place. Do you know what your soul is? If I ask you what your soul is, could you measure it? Could you pull it out and show it? How much does it weigh? They say you weigh minutely less when you die. Your soul is your intellect. How much can you weigh that? That's different, isn't it? Your soul is your conscience. You can't measure that, can you? Your soul is made up of your emotions. Pretty hard to put that on the scale. That's your, part of your soul. Your soul is the will that you have within you. None of those four things, they're, they're spoken of in the Bible, but none of those four things can you measure or weigh. But that all came from God in your conception. When a babe is conceived, there's a light that flickers. And this that God gives you becomes a part of your physical being that's going to grow. That's your soul. 
And so the Bible, the scriptures, are able to make you wise enough, educated enough, filled enough that that soul will be taken back to God when your eternity begins. Most people don't realize that. So they don't try to find out about that. They just say, I believe. And yeah, what do you believe? Able to save our souls. The scriptures. So that we can go back to our home. Back to that house. Back to that glory land life of, of heaven located somewhere. Out there. You won't have to be happy over a nine-tenths inch of rain. You won't have to be glad over the green fields that flow. And you won't have to worry about is that cow going to have her calf safe. Back to where we came from. This is what the scriptures are able to do. Why shouldn't we love them and hunger for them and, and delight in them more than anything else? Forget the boring aspect. Just think about the good thought that that scripture teaches us and delight in. Our soul will not only go back to God, but we will live a more contented life while we're here. Yeah, I know. I can feel with you. We've lost two. Older people have lost. Younger people are in the process of losing and things not going straight, and things not smoothing out. It's all a part of it. But in spite of that, godliness with contentment is great gain, and you can gain that, I guarantee you. Because you know there's more to it than what it looks like. So receive with gladness the engrafted Word of God. I want you to know this morning that in the Bible is everything that you need to know about becoming what? A saved person and added to the family of God. And what more could you want? In the Scriptures, we've studied it out. You've heard about it. And we looked it over and over again, and yes, it's there. You can know everything that it takes to save your soul and become a part of the family of God, being born again. And even though a good person is a good person, it takes more than that. Every thing according to the scriptures teaches us that we all have had to and still do if need to go through the birthing process. Hey, we have a great grandchild that's going to show up in about two or three weeks. How's that little one going to get here? That little one has to go through the birthing process. And that child has already been doing it. And any other great grandchildren are going to have to go the same way. I did, 
as clumsy as I was and still am, I went through the birthing process physically. They tell me it takes about nine months. Can you cheat on that? Yeah. It started out the way it has to start, and the nine months has to travel the way those nine months travel. And then, lo and behold, you make a hurried trip to the hospital. And that little one is not held by Ma and Pa and Grandma and Grandpa until the birthing process is complete. Simple mathematics. <laughs> two plus two equals five. You hope. Now just know it. Any good person has to go through the listening period of what the Bible says so that it can save you and go through the birthing process. You don't get in the family of God unless you are born into the family of God. Pure and simple. Then the Bible can give you everything you need to know about Christian conduct and Christian living, no matter what. There's a whole lot of things in the scriptures that are direct statements. You can't miss the Ten Commandments. <coughs> There's a whole lot of statements in the Bible that are indirect statements. Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. What does that say? It didn't list anything. It just told you an indirect statement that said, Hey, buddy, whatever you say and do, do it right. There's a gob of those in the Bible. The Bible can tell you everything you need to know in warning you about sin and the consequences of sin. And brother, if you want to try the course of finding out the hard way, you can do it. Oh. Have you ever had an ice cream cone that you just got started on and somehow it slipped and it turned upside down on the sidewalk? How many more warnings do you need to take better care of the ice cream cone the next time? You tell me, huh? Especially when you're a kid. I take good care of my ice cream, how about you? And I'm going to take pretty good care of staying away from some things out there that I already know is going to whip me out of shape and target me for the devil. Yeah. Again, the Bible can tell you everything you need to know about heaven and about hell. I don't know all there needs to be known about those two places, but I know one thing. I don't want to go one place, but I'm going to be do all I can to go to the other place. Now you stop and think about the depth of hell and the heat of hell and the endlessness of hell and everything else that goes along with hell and you'll want to go to heaven. Matter of fact, the Bible says you don't love mother, father, son, or daughter more than me or you're not worthy of me houses and lands and all that, kick them overboard for Jesus. The Bible's going to tell you everything you need to know about being prepared. Now you know that. This isn't new. So how could you want more? We receive with meekness the engrafted Word of God. 
because it's the best thing you have. Would you let me read you this? In France, there once lived a poor blind girl who somehow came by the Gospel of Mark and raised letters. Braille, you know. And so she learned to read it by the tips of her fingers. We understand that. And by constant, constant, constant reading, those fingers became calloused. And her sense of touch diminished till she couldn't distinguish the characters anymore. And she couldn't read it anymore. Read it. Get the understanding. One day, she even cut the skin from the tips of her fingers to increase their sensitivity, but it only destroyed it worse. I'll tell you, I would have just done one finger. Let's see if it worked before I did all of them. Anyway, back to the story. She felt that she must now give up her beloved book, the only one she had, and weeping, she pressed that book to her lips, saying, Farewell, farewell, sweet word of God, my heavenly Father. And to her surprise, her lips could detect the feel better than her fingers. And she had, so she had her Bible back again. And she read it all night. Does it take a blind person to appreciate the Bible? Receive with meekness the engrafted Word of God. Abraham Lincoln said this, I believe the Bible is the best gift God has ever given to man. All the good from the Savior of this world is communicated to us through that book. And that's very true. So let's read it with humility and go out and be a doer of the word. What do you say?